have gone up uh, lately and you find these positions by shorting stocks that have, have gone down in the, in the, in the early or in the, in the recent past. Okay? This is the momentum factor. In other papers, it's just momentum, M O M, uh, momentum factor. So you regress the momentum factor UMD on, on the intercept term alpha on the market factor, so beta 1 times mkt at time t plus beta 2 times smb at time t plus beta 3 times the value factor hml at time t plus, and now we continue again in the next row, plus beta 4 times rmw at time t, which is the profitability factor, plus beta 5 times cma at time t, plus an error term epsilon, which captures the regression residuals. Okay? So, I mean, obviously the alpha and the epsilon, you know, the regression residuals, they belong together somehow, because the alpha basically captures the systematic part of that guy here, yeah? So everything that is unexplained by exposures against these risk factors here is captured by the, by the alpha and by the epsilon. The epsilon captures the, in, the um, unsystematic part, yeah? the idiosyncratic part, and this captures the systematic mispricing, okay? And this is what we are most interested in. So if you test the six-factor model, yeah? let's say, we have under, under the null hypothesis H0 would be, uh, sorry, under the alternative hypothesis H1 would be the six factor model, six factor model, because the five factor model, yeah, which is under the null hypothesis, is nested in the six factor model. Okay? Like before, before we had the cap M and the three factor model because the cap M nests or is nested in the three factor model, and now we have under the non hypothesis the five factor model. Why? Because the five factor model is nested in the six factor model. Okay? So if we, if we now do this test, the only thing, yeah, there's only one variable that is more, yeah, basically in the six factor model than in the five factor model, and so we have only one equation, so we just want ordinary regression, we use OLS, and we test the estimated alpha, and we know already the estimated alpha um, uh, is normally distributed. Uh, so we check the t-statistic, and again, we check again the, the bell curve, we have our values, 1.96 on the right-hand side, and here, one point minus 1.96 on the left hand side and whenever the t statistic, let's say the t statistic of the alpha is 1.2 yeah, then it, the alpha the alpha would be or the t statistic would basically fall into this 95% probability so in this case we would say the 5 factor model is able to explain the uh, 6 factor model because it can, it can fully explain or price this additional factor of the six factor model, which is the momentum factor only. But if the alpha would be, let's say, 4.2, it would mean, okay, the test statistic indicate, or the test statistic is outside the, of the critical value here on the, on the, on the right-hand side of the distribution. In this case, you would say, okay, no, the five factor model cannot explain this additional risk factor of the six factor model, which is the momentum factor, yeah? because this alpha here is significant on a 5% level. In this case, we would then say, okay, the six factor model is the correct model, and we would reject the null hypothesis. Finally, now we have to discuss the test for non-nested models, okay? 
let's create some space here again. So now we have, we are talking about non nested models. What does that mean? Okay, we have uh, in the paper they discussed, for instance, the five factor model. Let's say model A is the five factor model, and uh, the five factor model has the market factor, which is somehow in all models. We have the size factor, S and D, we have the value factor, HML, we have the profitability factor, R and W, R and W, and in the original paper they're using operating profitability. So let's say R and W, O for operating profitability. Okay? And we have the CMA, which is the investment factor. And let's say model B we have the same variables actually, or the same sort of factors with the market factor. We have the SMB factor again, we have the HML factor again, but this time we have a profitability factor. RMW, which uses cash profitability instead, okay, which treats basically the accruals in in the accounting different from uh, the operating profitability. So let's say this guy has cash profitability instead, and also again we have the CMA factor here. So obviously we cannot say any longer that this, this model here, model A, nests in model B, because these variables here are completely different. This variable here doesn't pop up here in this equation, this is a different variable. So in this case, we are testing non-nested models, because this model here does not nest in this model here, because of this one variable. So, and then, as we, as we saw, if we talk about nested models, we know, okay, if the, we have to run this simultaneously equation model, multiple equation model using SUR technique, or if we have just one uh, more risk factor um, in one uh, enterprise model that we compare, then we use just a t-test, and okay, whenever this test statistic indicates that the intercept terms are significant, then we know Okay, it increases the mean variance frontier. So we know this is basically our, our test statistic that we are interested in, or how we can basically evaluate these, these models, or choose between models. But in this case, how, how would we choose among these two models? So what Farmer and French propose is, okay, we, we investigate which of these models has the higher maximum squared sharp ratio so the metric that we're interested in is the maximum squared sharp ratio this is basically very very much related or almost the same i would say like we discussed earlier so the basic idea is again yeah, we have the mean variance frontier, we have the expected return and the risk, the sigma, and then we check OK. We have model, let's say model A is here, with our risk free rate is here, here's RF. So this is model A, and let's say model B gives us something like this. Okay? Then we check all right where is the where is the uh, 
here is our optimal portfolio for the first portfolio, portfolio A, and for B, it's here. Yeah? So, in this case, obviously, we would choose B, right? Because it has, so let's say this is B and this is A. So we see that portfolio B, the risk of portfolio B, or the increase in risk, is lower than the increase in return. So the uh, delta of R is larger than the delta of risk sigma. So because the increase in return of portfolio B is larger than the increase in risk, yeah, so the sharp relationship, the risk-return relationship is much better for uh, portfolio B in, in this case, okay? Or for the uh, uh, risk factors of, of uh, as a private model B. So in this case, you would choose obviously model B. So it's about maximizing the uh, sharp ratio. What is the maximum sharp ratio or the maximum squared sharp ratio? And then, of what we know is if we have data and we estimate the, the, the sharp ratio given data set, it's a point estimate. What you get is a point estimate. So it doesn't tell you much about the actual significance or um, you cannot, it's difficult to make inference upon like one, one uh, point estimate, okay? So what you would need is actually distribution. So what you have to compound then or what you have to consider then is so first you check, okay, the point estimate, what's, which one has the higher maximum square, square sharp ratio, but also how often can model B, or is model B able to beat model A? So you make simulation runs, this is what we will also discuss very soon. You make simulation runs and then you check in how many, let's say you have 100,000 simulations and you've figured out, okay, in, in 99,000 simulation runs, model B is able to beat model A, then, then it, it means that in 99% of runs, model B is better than model A, which, is, which gives you obviously a strong case for this initial result, okay? But it could also be, let's say, that you have in your, in your, in your point estimate gives you the same thing here, okay? The increase in return is larger than the increase in risk, so the sharp ratio of, of model B is better than the sharp ratio of model A, so you would basically at first glance, you would choose model B, but it could be that in simulation runs, again, you run 100,000 simulations, it could be that model B is only able to outperform model A in, let's say, 50,000 out of 100,000 runs. What would that mean? That would mean that uh, both models are actually statistically the same. It, and this also means that the difference here in the point estimate is basically just a noise. Yeah? It's, it's, you cannot say that this is that model B is uh, performing better than model A, yeah? even though at first glance the point estimate will tell you that. But if you have simulation runs and you get rid of the noise basically and it tells you that in only 50% of the cases like throwing a coin, yeah, model B will outcomes model A, so these models are statistically then basically the same. So, and also of course, you can compare more than only two models, yeah? so you can have many models here that you compare model A, B, C, D, E, F, G, yeah? and again, you would of course um, check which of these models has the highest maximum square sharp ratio, and then you would do the statistical test, you would do the simulation studies, and then you would check, okay, which of these models um, can beat the, the other models, or at, 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 which, fre at, at which frequency uh, model C and D can beat model A and B and so on and so forth. So you would go through all these models and check how well they perform uh, against all the other models. And then you would make, uh, you would choose the model based upon 
which model beats most of the others most often. Simply said. So again, non-nested models. So we can point estimate, and uh, you have you, the the first simulation. What they propose in the paper is a full sample simulation. Yeah. So what you basically get is you get a, the you make a simulation run, and then you get instead of the actual number, you get a, an average or a median of the simulated sharp ratio. Yeah. So you do basically. 100,000 simulations get different values for this maximum square sharp ratio or sharp ratio and then you basically take the average of all the simulation runs and this average can be higher or lower than the actual number so this is the first thing this is what we will discuss now you see there are many things to write down This is obviously something that's difficult to uh, explain or to teach without a whiteboard. Yeah? So you see a whiteboard is very, very useful in teaching, at least from my point of view. So let's say we start with a matrix. Okay? So we have the market factor, we have the size factor S and B, we have the HML factor, And we have the profitability factor, R and W, using operating profitability, we have it here. We have the profitability factor, R and W, 